Hey there, I'm Christopher Schoenwald, and welcome to Life as a, a show intently focused on helping people find their professional pathway by exploring and unearthing the details of jobs from around the world. Cities which flourish often owe much of their success to a careful balance amongst progressive leadership, policy, and execution. Not to be forgotten, however, is a careful recognition and measured approach towards sustaining what positively defines a locale and delivers benefit and reward to its citizenry. All of this, of course, is easier said than done. I mean, present day complexities of managing the interests of millions have an innate way of throwing wrenches into the maintenance of a city as a whole and its assets. Take the example of a metropolis defined by an industry such as film and television production. Overseeing a city based around a sector like that can be both a real opportunity and challenge for a multitude of reasons. Our guest today knows a thing or two about all of this. In essence, one of his major roles is acting as an intermediary attempting to balance the needs of a globally renowned city up against the wants of an industry which contributes billions of dollars to their local economy. All right, welcome to the show. So Jeff Tioli is the film commissioner of the third largest motion picture production center in all of North America, Vancouver, BC. He's a highly collaborative motion picture and television executive focused on supporting industry priorities of workforce development, sustainability, and infrastructure investments that build and support the film industry in Vancouver. A mere sampling of his duties and experiences include attracting high-impact investment initiatives on the city's behalf to developing and executing strategic plans right on through to technology transformation and change management. Now, much of Jeff's passion towards work stems from his belief that a strong creative sector, and I love this, is at the heart of all great cities, driving innovation, growth, and high-paying jobs. In his words, the film industry pushes the creative economy beyond traditional industry boundaries into tourism, arts and culture, digital entertainment, and gaming, and countless other indirect beneficiaries. In addition to his deep industry knowledge and multi-tiered experiences accrued across and over the past two decades working within the sector, Jeff holds an MBA from the BD School of Business at Simon Fraser University, as well as certificates in integrated management, strategic leadership, and entertainment law from the University of British Columbia. And Jeff is also equipped with a diploma of technology, as well as marketing management technology from British Columbia Institute of Technology. So with all that stated, Jeff, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the program. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Really excited about this talk. As am I. I've I've seen a lot of your work before, and I'm really, really um, honored to be here. Thanks. Well, yeah, in the spirit of things, why don't we get started here? And I do have a first segment lined up, something called Coloring Wikipedia. It's a segment where I just read off a definition of what a guest does or sometimes their industry. Now, unfortunately, when I went to Wikipedia, I didn't actually see a write-up for your position as a film commissioner. However, they did have something there that we can work with. They had film commission. So I'm just going to read that off. And within the context of all that you do, all that you have done, and probably what you will be doing in the future, maybe you could comment on that after and see how well it measures up. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right. So here we go. Film commission. Film commissions are organized by local government bodies together with nonprofit organizations and the like and serve as the administrative window concerned with attracting and supporting the productions that come to their locality, not only from other parts of their own countries, but from abroad as well. Film commissions believe that by attracting productions to their area, they can provide direct economic benefit through rental of hotel rooms, locations, vehicles, etc an indirect benefit by the increased exposure appearing in films and television. So a little bit general, I suppose, but Mm -hmm. uh, at first take, what do you think of that? A couple thoughts on that. And before I answer that question, I actually wanted to um, acknowledge the fact that I am here in Vancouver, which is on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. You know, the people that have been here for time immemorial and stewards of the land. And as, as a descendant of settlers, being able to live here in this part of the world, it's really an honor and privilege uh, to be able to to be here and speak to you from this this part of the world today. So, and I just wanted to acknowledge that fact. It's um it's really important for us here to to recognize that. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're welcome. So, to your question, I think there's there's two things. So, I think the the base description is is pretty close. One thing that I notice is missing is the word jobs. Mm. That kind of, that kind of stood out to me. So, in 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 my role, I think about jobs a lot. And I would say that the other part that's not missing, but I think that is, that is a type of film commission, 
there's another type. I put film commissions around the world and there's hundreds of them into kind of two buckets. That definition is the bucket of mostly about investment attraction. Often that's a new territory that's trying to start up in the sector, or maybe they have a small sector and they want to grow it. So a lot of that's about investment attraction. And then you have the other bucket, which is, you know, Vancouver, Toronto, LA, New York, London, you know, they already have a decades long established sector. And the focus of that has been shifted and the balance has gone away from investment attraction. Not that that's not still part of the job much more into production support and service, maintaining that mm-hmm. reputation. You know, you, you spend decades building a reputation that filmmakers want to come. They know in the, in the global market, everybody knows where these cities are and what they offer. So our film commission in Vancouver, for example, I would say is in, a, in more of the later definition where it is more about sustained service, jobs, economy. Yeah. Right, right. Well, that's really interesting. And I would suspect as well that perhaps some of those mature sort of markets that like Vancouver, New York, and some of the, ones, the other ones that you referenced, are also probably transitioning towards like being even more progressive, perhaps policies that, that are in place that might be attractive to film companies that have particular passions within, say, sustainability or, you know, some of these mm-hmm. other areas, or maybe it's technological advancements that you're you're pushing forward. Perhaps we're going to get into all of this later on today. But, I'm sure uh, we will. Yeah. I, I'm guessing, yeah, I'm guessing that's part of it as well. Or am I into something there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, it's a very dynamic industry. Mm -hmm. And the organizations that work in it and serve it, including film commissions, have to be dynamic. The cities that, and we'll get into this a little bit later on, the the cities that succeed really well are also able to respond to that. It is a mindset that a city has to be able to manage, right? Well, to paint an even clearer picture of what you do, I suppose, in in your role, what would be a a typical day? You know, I know it's Hmm. a difficult question because probably there aren't too many difficult days, I'd imagine, in a position like that in which you're holding. But, uh, you know, maybe a a brief overview of, you know, what takes your time. Yeah. Typical day or typical kind of week is, you know, a lot of the work that that I'm doing now in in the film commissioner role is related to, as I said, you know, like that that sustaining, sustaining the success of, of everything that's preceded me. One, for example, area that we've been very successful at and I spend a lot of my time on every week, often every day, is in relation to sustainability, specifically on how to get the film industry to be able to help it uh, achieve its goal of getting off of um, the use of diesel generators, Yeah, uh, as an example. So fossil fuel use is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases, uh, and one of the the carbon footprint of the film production is related to fuel. So, you know, a lot of my work every day goes into that. Emerging issues uh, related to workforce development, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and reconciliation uh, as well is, you know, again, kind of part of almost a daily conversation. You know, those are the yeah. two big priorities. There's still work related to investment attraction. You know, we mm-hmm. still do get call, even though we're, everyone knows about Vancouver, what that means is that anyone who's thinking about getting into the sector, of, say, for example, a big investment firm, real estate investment firm that maybe is not in yeah. the area, but they want, maybe they've had some success in setting up a studio in, in another part of the world, like LA, and they want to expand. They're almost right. immediately going to to look around the world, like where where is the business? Right. The big difference between what we we're talking about before the two different types of commission is I don't have to go down to LA and tell them, hey, we're, we're, we're here, think about us. It's often they will contact us and say, we've heard Vancouver is a great place to set up shop. Yeah. Tell us why. Fill us in. Validate. Yeah. So that's the investment traction part of it. That's a big part of it. I have an amazing team within the city of Vancouver on the operational side. So I'm not too involved in day-to-day operations. We put out three to four film permits a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty significant and high volume. You know, if there's a big troubleshooting issue, I'll get pulled into it. But for the most part, you know, I've got a, a really great team. Yeah. within the city. So things run pretty smoothly there. And uh, government relations, you know, we are a municipality. So mm-hmm. we also have to maintain our relationships and ties and working in, hand in hand with other jurisdictions. There's the province of BC, there's the yeah. federal government. There's also the organizations like the Health and Safety Works at BC, got kind of regulatory yeah. bodies. So there's a lot of kind of work on that. You know, example, like with COVID, all of those groups had to come together right. to figure out how are we, how are we going to get the industry through this and, and to the other side. So there's a lot of that kind of collaboration with different government agencies. In the province, mm-hmm. we actually have a provincial film commission. So mm-hmm. there's a provincial and regional and municipal. And so, you know, all of that collaboration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of meetings, a lot of <laughs> yeah, meetings. I I say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably yeah. had your fill of Zoom meetings the last few Yeah, years. for sure. Process improvement. I've always, I can't look at anything without thinking about how can I make it better. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that a mature film commission has to always be thinking about is how do we make the user experience for, for our clients better? You know, yeah. we put out a permit now with, you know, with a three days notice and, 
you know, an online application, you know, are there steps in that online application that we can improve on? And we're always trying to think about that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that process improvement piece comes along with it as well. When you're in in this type of market where it's just more Mm. like sustaining the success, staying ahead of of the competition in a way. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, it sounds like you're wearing a lot of different hats. Yeah. A few different hats, quite a few different responsibilities. Yeah. It keeps Uh, it very interesting. Yeah. I was about to say, I mean, the course of doing this program and interviewing people like yourself, you know, from around the world, that, that, that would seem to be one of the, the patterns, though, of fulfillment, or at least, you know, for a lot of people, is that the more hats that they're wearing, of course, you know, stress levels mm-hmm. can go up and there can be challenging moments. I'm not discounting any of that. But at the same time, too, I think it also offers this this reward, you know, in, and yeah. also allowing opportunities to step outside of one world or one sphere of your job and then into another. And it kind of, in a way, keeps things fresh, I, I would suspect. And maybe that's the case for you, too. But without going it too much further because it would take up the whole day talking about it. But yeah, one of the things I love about the film industry is, uh, and the roles I've always had in them, is there are these two worlds. Yeah. You know, there's the, the film industry world. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's, you know, the real world, as we sometimes would call it, uh, when I was in the industry and, and, and vice versa. And being able to kind of flow in between yeah. those worlds, be able to kind of go over or under the wall Right. Very different worldviews is 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 really exciting, and it's it's certainly something that I enjoy doing. Not everybody likes that; they like one worldview or the other. Yeah, I like being able to kind of go back and forth. Yeah, yeah, it sounds invigorating yeah. to me. That's the way yeah, I'm yeah, kind of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, excellent. Well, I would like to transition into a new segment here, and this mm-hmm. is actually a brand new segment for the show for Life as a. And it's something called pathways, and it's actually the the theme of the questions coming into this segment aren't new. But it's related to this idea of pathways, career pathways. And a lot of times I think people believe that, you know, especially youth, they think that, you know, it's like this linear straight line. This is my dream when you're in your 20s or whatever, teens, and this is the job that I want. Okay. And most people just go straight towards it and everything works out perfectly. But again, in the course of running this show, that's not the case. It's usually left-hand turns, zigging and zagging and so on and so forth. So in the spirit of that, I think it'd be really interesting to, to dive into your history a little bit here. Like, how did you end mm-hmm. up in this position? You know, what, what was your path, essentially, if you could give a yeah. brief overview of that? I, I, love, I love this segment it, it, because you've, you've touched on something that I think is part of my pathway is of the two you described, the latter, right? I did not ever think about getting this industry. Um, hmm. I kind of just fell into it. And, and, wow. and interesting enough is, is I have family in the, in the industry that have been in it longer than I have. And I have a, a aunt here in Vancouver, who's a makeup artist. I have a cousin who's a director based out of Toronto, very prolific. When I was younger, I was going through BCIT and my business management program. I'd come out of that and I wasn't finding jobs that I was really satisfied with. Most of them were in hmm. sales and things like that. So I went back to working at the bar and the bartending <laughs> and, um, a bit of a left in there. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple, a couple <laughs> of entrepreneurial endeavors that racked up the credit cards and didn't go anywhere. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, but every time they would bring this up, I'm like, I'm not a creative. I'm management. I'm business and right. stuff like that. And eventually, my aunt convinced me to come to a, a, a rap party at her house. And it was after a, a little Canadian show called Madison at the time. It's kind of a Canadian 90210. Yeah. And I didn't know anybody there, so I sat down on the sofa, and there were some people sitting beside me. And they asked what I was doing. And I told them, you know, not much uh, and trying to figure that out. <laughs> and uh, when they heard what I did, they said, you should go, you know, get in the film industry. And I same thing. I'm like, I'm not a creative. It's not for me. And they're like, no, no, there's this whole business side. It's show business. It's two words, mm-hmm. show business. And they told me a little bit about what they did. They were assistant directors, which are kind of like manage the set, manage the schedule. And so after, you know, didn't take me long, like 48 hours of research. I'm like, okay, well, why not? And so I went down to the, the director's guild, which is the guild that manages, you know, location managers, ADs, production mm-hmm. managers, mm-hmm. management and, uh, and, and signed up and, and started getting some work and really quickly kind of advanced. And suddenly like 20 years later, I'm here you are top of my game. And, and, yeah. um, and looking back at, at 20 years of prolific career, not no intention uh, originally at all. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's really yeah. interesting. I, yeah. 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 And that's, that was the first half of my career. And then, yeah. and then, you know, after that, I did start to kind of get a bit of burnout after 20 years and I was looking for something a little bit more, a, a change, I would say. Yeah. And then I started becoming purposeful. Mm. So it was when I, when I was young, I was like, just go with the flow, figure it out. As I, right. as I went through my career and age, I started to become like, more, I need to be more purposeful. Yeah. And so that's when I started the transition out of production and into more executive roles and, and how I landed in that part. And so where I went from leaving production in 2013 to now, you know, every step of the way was, mm. you know, planned and, and, okay. and, 
and purposeful. So I've been both, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's really interesting, actually. You know, considering it that way, where you, you, you never know initially. I think in, in your youth, like it's, you, you have a rough idea where you might want to go sometimes. And then sometimes in your mm-hmm. case, like, I love that story where you really didn't know. And it just sort of comes up through conversations. You meet this person, that person. I think the key oftentimes is just keeping that, you know, that that mindset of just being open to possibility and listening, mm-hmm. and, you know, investigating. So I think that's, that's probably the first true, true gem of this conversation. I think for for listeners who are still somewhat undecided about, you know, what their past might be or might be stressed yeah. out about them, I think that is a really useful bit of information. So, yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. I think it's turned out fairly well for you. <laughs> I'd, I'd say. say. Yeah. 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 Alrighty. Well, maybe we can move into another segment here and we can just kind of mm-hmm. continue this back and forth. It's a QA and a discovery. And in researching for this talk, I came across, I mean, so many illustrative stats in terms of the city of Vancouver, in terms of the scale and importance of the film and television industry to that city itself. I eventually settled on a few stats here via the Vancouver Economic Commission. You're probably well familiar with these, but for listeners, I just want to really quickly read them off. So Here it goes. On average, the city is home to approximately 65 plus movies and 55 TV series annually, as well as hundreds of other filming days for commercials, TV pilots, and other features. I mean, that unto itself kind of speaks volumes to the value that this whole industry brings to the city itself. And I'd love to know, like, what do you attribute both the scale and success to? What what has made Vancouver you know, what it is within this industry. Why has it been able to uh, to achieve such levels of success and, and sustain it? So I think, you know, we, we talk about something at the Vancouver Economic Commission, they call it the three T's. And, you know, one of them is the, the tax credits. Uh, first of all, you know, we have a tax credit program. Almost every jurisdiction that wants to attract filming has some type of tax credit program. Right. And, and so I'd say we have a well-established, very strong credit program that is essentially money in the bank for the producers. It's yeah. it, if you get pre-qualified for this, you you get it. You can actually use it as collateral to get some oh. film financing. That type of thing. It's so well respected and established. It is not like the highest percentage. You know, you go around the world and see someone offers this. Thir- you know, there's a competition. I do, I'll, I'll give you thirty percent. I'll give you forty percent. Right. I'll give it on your labor. I'll give it on your. And there's yeah. all these different varieties of different programs. Some of them have caps. We'll give you this percentage, but only up to okay. X number of dollars. Or yeah. you need. We'll give it to some people, but not everybody. So there's a lottery. We do none of that. You know, the, the standards are pretty simple. You get it and there's no cap. And so it, it, they often, you know, the numbers on the surface don't mean much, but people know that we have a really good program and it's, yeah. and it's, it um, works trusted. Yeah. You don't want to count on something like that. And then find out a couple of years later, there's been a change in government and suddenly they don't want to do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, that can, you know, that can destroy, destroy all the efforts to build up an industry. Yeah. You um, want yeah. And that's all I'll say about tax credits. Uh, because I think that that there's a whole bunch of other factors because everyone has tax credits. So why does Vancouver do well? Yeah. Right. And I think it's on the other aspects of it. So time zone, that's something mm-hmm. none of us really control, but we are in LA time zone. And as long as LA is the you know center of the filmmaking universe, yeah. the, the closer you are and, and the easier it is to do business goes back to, it's easy yeah. to do business in your time zone. It's easy to fly. It's less than a three hour flight, right? And there's many flights per day on many different airlines. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's again ease of doing business that certainly helps and then you know going back to what i started off with the talent the jobs you know five decades we're, we're now you know seeing third generation filmmakers that are in vancouver the grandchildren of people that started making film filming yeah. years yeah. ago are starting to enter the industry and so that depth of talent and knowledge is is extremely valuable. And you hear producers say it all the time, like that they recognize the talent up here and the productivity of the talent. Mm -hmm. Um, Call it a good Canadian work ethic or whatever you want, Mm -hmm. but like you get your money's worth on your labor up here and, and you get more than just your money's worth. You get creativity, talent, experience across the board. You know, and there's a term in the film industry called above the line and below the line. Mm -hmm. And if you've you've heard that, yeah. Essentially, below, below the line is kind of operational such, and everything above is yeah. often your, your key creatives, your directors, your cast, your yeah. your um, producers, and but in all aspects of that now. So you know, Vancouver used to be more on the on the below the line area. Now we have a lot more you know, cast, mm-hmm. directors, producers that um, have you know have a lifetime and uh, sometimes multi generations of experience. So that would be the three T's. The other thing is we have an incredibly strong industry association. 
mm-hmm. and uh, which brings together many, many stakeholders from you know producers and employers to U.S. studios to the unions to the vendors who you know rent air conditioners to lighting equipment to yeah. like everybody. And I think one of the things that in any anywhere in the world, if you look at an industry cluster or super cluster you're going to find really strong industry associations. Yeah. Like that that's that, that that's that's one of those indicators, economic indicators you look for. Mm-hmm. A place that's going to have a cluster is going to have industry associations. And yeah. and the stronger and the bigger they are, the more likelihood that that cluster is yeah. going to be stronger and bigger. So there's that's a, a and I think that's one of the secret sauces in, in Vancouver. Uh, unfortunately, I'd like a lot of other jurisdictions are starting to figure that out. I'm watching and listening to what what everyone's doing. A lot of them are trying to set up their own industry association. Actually, I shouldn't say unfortunately. I think it's for the better of the industry as a whole, growing the pie as a whole, people right. are seeing what we're doing. And I think that's the other aspect of Vancouver, which is kind of interesting. I've seen in the last you know five to 10 years is we used to watch what other people did and then emulate. Mm-hmm. I've seen that turn around now. Mm-hmm. And so you know, Vancouver now is a place where other people look to what are we doing and how can yeah. we copy that success story to me that's really really cool like, that's from a mark got, right that is yeah, a mark yeah, right there yeah, and yeah. uh yeah I, you know i had a guest on not too long ago you know somebody that you're well familiar with clara george tv producer who's turned sustainability consultant and that was one of the discussion points in terms of you know what we were speaking of you know relating to sustainability and how vancouver's really become this model that a lot of mm-hmm. other major locations whether it be la whether it be london new york elsewhere are trying to model some of their policies, you know, the use of maybe electric generators, so on and so mm. forth. And yeah, I think that speaks to that point. It, it really does sort of like mark the city as progressing, you know, progressing to this this, this next level, I suppose. Yeah. And, yeah. and just listening to you in the last couple of minutes here, I think it also speaks, speaks to this point of just infrastructure, infrastructure mm. of people, infrastructure of the systems of these organizations. It just seems like it's well-established, but not only that, continually evolving, which you know, actually leads into my next question, if you don't mind, mm-hmm. which is Vancouver has sort of developed this, you know, image of this progressive city in a lot of different respects, even outside of, you know, film and television. But within that industry, in, in particular, I just mentioned sustainability, obviously, like technology, and so on and so forth. How here's the question in terms of that, like, how does the city keep up with all of that? And then the second part of this question, if you will, is how do you as a professional keep up mm. with all of that? Because it's, it's a lot. I mean, just things we're lightly speaking of here, that there's some fairly deep issues that are going on and happening and trying to keep that city positioned, you know, in such a way that it is attractive. It must be, mm-hmm. uh, must be a bit of a challenge. And also to really quickly throw in that I know sometimes the local governments and stakeholders have this penchant for moving a little bit slower, but Vancouver has mm-hmm. been, you know, been a bit of the opposite in some respects, at least. But I'll let you. Take yeah. It well, I think you know Vancouver is, you know, in many areas of its work, you know, a progressive city. Yeah. Uh, and we have some. We certainly have some mandates that help and align really well with the film mandates, and that pushes things along a bit better. You're related to, you know, our city is one of the first to declare a climate emergency back in 2018. Uh, we were one of one of the first cities, maybe in the world, to develop an undrip strategy. Just that we just announced a week ago, and, and uh, you know what undrip is. The, the United Nations uh, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. There's a lot of progressive uh, elements to to what we do here at the city, and that certainly helps. So that again, that mindset of the city. You know, as far as like how do we stay on top of it? It goes back to what I was talking about before. Like it is a lot of listening and, and paying attention in relationships. The industry association, for example, we you know we're engaged a lot with them. I was just down in Los Angeles, and they invited me to come down and speak on a couple of subjects. So you know, and that's you know just being in the room, listening to the conversations yeah. and understanding. I got to say, it doesn't hurt that I have 20 years of production experience. And so the relationships and the, and the, the, the understanding that I have, mm-hmm. that also helps me on coming into the city because I've, I've brought forth some ideas and said some things to my superiors that they've looked at me and said, you know, your predecessors may not have thought, may have said the opposite mm-hmm. or that won't work. And luckily I have worked for really great people who, yeah. if I say, you know, Trust me, there, whatever this thing is, the industry will find value in it, and it might seem risky to you, mm-hmm. but the film industry will appreciate it or see value in it and and see it as low risk. So let's go for it and and take a leap of faith. So there is a little bit of that that happens, and uh, I'm very fortunate that I have uh, that that experience to kind of lean on. Well, you can um, speak the language of both parties, essentially, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would say that also goes to. I'm fortunate that I work in a department of the city that works with an industry that is really progressive and agile and, and risk tolerant. Mm-hmm. So almost every initiative that we've been successful on 
I, I, you know, I struggle to claim even the majority of the credit because the industry has told us they want this thing. And then my job is just kind of figure out how to make that happen. Facilitate it. Yeah. And, okay. and so my job is more like just kind of sitting back, putting together the pieces and then coming up with a solution, a suggestion that, okay, do you want this? This is the way we could do it. Yeah. Often that first, that first attempt fails and they're like, nah, change it, you know, but it's very agile. It's very quick. And so, you know, when it comes to change management and government, there's often, you know, you have to deal with the change management internally, which mm-hmm. I would say, is, you know, is, is definitely also better in, in my department, maybe because I have a very agile group of people working with us in the film industry. It's just, it wears off on you, even if you're a bureaucrat. I, we're working with an industry that does have a high risk tolerance. And, you know, that's not always the case. Sometimes you might be working with an industry that's a little bit, you know, has a different worldview, a little bit more established. Maybe they're also a regulatory style of industry. So change is hard on both sides. And so I think that I'm fortunate as well that, that I have an industry group that's very tolerant of, of some of the uh, the change and the risk that I'm willing yeah, to take. That, you know, that uh, point came up in conversation with Clara, you know, yeah. the, Clara George, the, the producer, and she was talking about that in terms of that, that industry, film and television, like their history is built on finding another way. I mean, you know, if they mm-hmm, have a production mm-hmm. shoot and suddenly the weather changes, you know, they have to find another way to get this shot, to get it done. So it's almost like a culture issue within the industry where they're built to think, you know, well, if I can't do this, then maybe I can do this, this, or this. And yeah. that sort of attitude, just that attitude by people and mm-hmm. the players within the industry, yeah, that probably helps tremendously in terms of pushing forward. Oh, you know, absolutely. And- it helped tremendously during during COVID. It was one of the 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 first and fastest industries to recover. I think yeah. because of that that mindset. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. yeah. In terms of all of this for you, how how is it for you and keeping up with it all? Is that, you know, I'm going to use this word again, invigorating? I mean, there, there must be some degree of stress at times, or maybe there's some areas that you have a passion for, whereas others like, well, you know, you kind of really have to push yourself a little bit harder to. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the, the pace is is different, you know, in the film industry, your projects and your challenges were often measured in, in, in weeks, maybe months, three weeks, three months. You know, here it's, you know, years. It's, mm-hmm. It still takes time. There is a certain level of kind of, you know, you have to manage that frustration, you know, because, yeah. you know, you're coming from 20 years of things happening really, really quickly and a high level of risk tolerance to to working here. But I, I would say that, you know, the reward is and what, you know, keeps me going on a lot of the stuff is, you know, the work that we're doing here and that I'm doing is, you know, the big difference is for when I was in film production for the first half of my career, it was mostly about like, what is that current project doing for me? Yeah. Right. My, my career, my income, my mortgage, you know, and such like that. And in this last half of the career, it's been more about what I'm doing for the industry. It's sometimes it's harder. It's more challenging. You got, you know, there's more hoops to jump through uh, and a lot more stakeholders. But when you, when you see, for example, like, you know, uh, another, another city, another jurisdiction coming to us for, you know, for advice and saying that, you know, Hey, you're doing a great job on this. You know, you know, that that's very rewarding. Right. And, and also, when you know you think about like the role that I have now is a lot about how do I make sure this industry is going to be surviving after you know I'm long gone, yeah. thriving after I'm long mm-hmm. gone. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of reward to that, right? Yeah. No doubt. So no doubt. Yeah. And also too, I guess it's you're you're doing things on scale. So again, returning mm-hmm. to the point of say sustainability, if you're setting a policy where okay we're going to be phasing out diesel generators in X amount of years and going all electric, like that, that's a different level of reward as well, because you're serving yeah. not only the industry, you're serving humanity at that point, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> to, to be frank, right? I mean, to be honest. So yeah, I, I can totally see that, how there would be yeah. that, that it, extra it's... level of, you know, incentive attached to it. Mm-hmm. All. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. I have this other question here, actually, and uh, it's something I shared off the top, which is a comment from you about how mm. this this notion of a strong creative sector is really the heart of all great cities. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, I read that somewhere yeah, a long I time ago, yeah. and and so I can't I can't attribute the quote okay. to anybody specifically. It's not my original. You know, I might have wordsmithed it a bit since I've yeah. in my own my own words, but the idea of it came to me, came to me through something. And I wish I could remember what it was now so long ago. And it just made me think, I'm like, what, what do they mean by this? And, and, just, you know, anecdotally just started thinking about and observing, you know, what are the great cities in the world? Mm. And, and is that true? Right. Yeah. You know, to kind of yeah. test the hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. And you start, you start to think about that, like, you know, like Toronto and New York and, and London and Paris, and, mm-hmm. you know, you name it. They, there's always this creative energy, this vibrancy in the yeah. communities that, that trickles into everything, right? And you know, you know, the obvious parts are like film industry, uh, arts, entertainment, music. You know, there's a lot of flow back and forth between those. 
But mm-hmm. I think it even goes in 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 further to that. You know, we talked about you know uh, tourism, for example, yeah. and just you know seeing a a city on screen that's that's vibrant and exciting attracts people to come to it. Mm-hmm. You know, having a city that's that's vibrant has a strong arts and culture uh, community attracts people to want to live there, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. like so so that a lot of that's kind of an- anecdotal. I, you know, but I would love to find some, some economic students as university students that would actually do like a study on, you know, global mm. cities and the correlation between those, those two things. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I suspect that it's a hypothesis that would be validated with data in the meantime, it's observational for me. And I, I think that, you know, oh, you know, your listeners, if they have the chance to kind of, to think about it in their own cities, um, is there, is there a correlation or not? It's, there's certainly a reason why there's hundreds of film commissions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, you know, in the world, maybe thousands that are yeah. all trying to attract the, the the film industry because they see that 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 connection, right? How it how it has those all those indirect impacts to a whole bunch of other sectors in in the economy. So yeah, no, nah, no doubt. I mean, it doesn't help or it doesn't hurt. Rather, you know, the glitz and the glamour of it, and you know, that attracts a lot of people into it. But then, mm-hmm. like, also like these other points that are just you know, a lot more practical, just the jobs themselves. You know, like you, you mentioned, like within your own family. You know, mm-hmm. people doing makeup, for example, or the directing or this or that. I myself, when I was in my in my youth, I spent about four months in Vancouver, actually. And uh, yeah, I was just a university student at the time. And the, I'd never been there, actually, at that point. I'm from Canada, but I'd never been to Vancouver and never lived there, no less. And the thing that struck me right away was just the scale of it, you know, it kind of blew mm-hmm. me away. I think I'd signed up for just, you know, some extra, extra money and just for the experience of like getting on set as an extra, just for fun, you know, just for fun. And it just blew me away just how big it was. I mean, it was something I'll never forget, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's just sort of representative of this idea of just like the, the scale of it and what it can be and what it does represent to a lot of people, not only with on the creative side, but you know where you're living right now and the business side of it as well, but, you know. Vancouver yeah. has developed this reputation and most certainly it's driving, you know, that, that the image of that city forward in a lot of different respects and, you know, yeah, it's around the world that are involved with, you know, film and television production. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I really like that. I really find that quite compelling. Well, I do have one last question actually in this segment, if you wouldn't mind, Jeff, and mm-hmm. it's about you. I mean, in terms of your career right now, I mean, we've spoken to it, you know, in terms of how you've kind of evolved into where you're at right now and what you're doing. But what does it come to represent for you, you know, the, the, the career that you've had and, you know, moving forward right now? Are there any particular rewarding moments or highlights along the way that you'd like to be able to well, really like to share? You know, I think I, we touched a little bit on it, the, the rewarding part for me now is is yeah. being able to kind of think about how my contributions will lead to something that might be like, I won't call it a legacy, but like a, like a multi-generational impact, right? Yeah you know, here in the city, but also, but also globally. I mean, the, the clean energy part of it is something that I'm r- really, really happy to be a part of and, and proud to lead where in the areas that we can, because Vancouver won't be successful in that particular project unless everybody else in the world comes along for the ride. Yeah. And and so, you know, to your point earlier, it's like, if we succeed, that's going to mean that every other city in the world is going to succeed. Like no one's saying, Mm-hmm. send us all your, your, you know, your fossil fuel, dirty productions, right. <laughs> you know, it's it, everyone wants now the, you know, the, yeah. the, the clean tech and stuff like that. So that's kind of one of the, the other accomplishment that actually is not in my current role, but my, my previous role between leaving production and coming to the city of Vancouver, I ran a, a health and safety association called act safe safety association. Okay. And that was my kind of transition out of the film industry into executive leadership. And when I took over the organization, it was, you know, a, a small organization with, you know, half a dozen staff and, and offered some classes in the back room of a building downtown. And over the course of my time there and working with, with, with the board and the industry representatives and, and such, we really transformed that organization. We moved it into a, a bigger office. We increased the staff and the budget, okay. and we started uh, offering a lot more uh, health and safety training programs and courses and really transformed it from essentially was a health and safety communications and newsletter with a little bit of training to, um, to an industry institution where okay. it's now like um, at, at the core of almost every, actually everybody that comes into the film industry is taking a course from them and, and hopefully uh, learning something that will save them from, you know, getting injured or worse on a film set. Mm-hmm. And so that, to me, that was actually also one of the, the things I'm really proud about in my career. And I watched that organization closely after I've left uh, to, to almost, you know, like a, a parent watching from, from course, afar yeah. um, and it's so happy with, with uh, the direction they're going in. And so I think those are kind of the, the two big, if I look back at my career, you know, helping the industry get off uh, the use of fossil fuels and, mm-hmm. and hopefully creating a, 
a healthier and safer work environment would be kind of the two big rewards for me. Yeah. 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 So, yeah both of those, not, not, not too shabby on a higher yeah, front, yeah. You know? <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like the, the, the fascinating thing to me is like, they're both on scale. So like you said, I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're affecting a lot of people and moving forward as well. You know, people that are entering this industry are going to be affected by some of these policies and some of these things that, you know, you set up and yeah, I can see how you most easily derive some degree of satisfaction from all of that. So yeah, well, I'm sure there's gonna be a few more things. You're certainly not done. And uh, we'll keep an eye on those things as well. Yeah. We get more. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could shift over into this middle segment here, if you don't mm. mind. It's something called a water cooler story segment. And here I just ask guests to indulge listeners with a story related to the profession. So I'd be really eager to, uh, to hear what you have for us today. Mm-hmm. The story that, that I'd want to share with a lot of the listeners is I tried to get out of the film industry after 20 years. Mm. And uh, an interesting a bit of my, my career is I was trying to get out of production. I'd seen a lot of transferable skills in, you yeah. know, in, 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 you know, public relations, accounting, operations, project management, you know, you know, all those type of things. It was extremely difficult to, to do that. I applied for all kinds of jobs that I was thought that I was mm-hmm. a perfect match for and never got a call. And, yeah. and uh, I was, I was a film person and, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that I had to realize was that, you know, I had spent 20 years from, you know, from my, my twenties into, into my forties in, in the film industry, developing the skill set. And, you know, when it comes to like career pathways, going back to that kind of pathway idea is, well, that wasn't purposeful. It did kind of set the foundation of my value as a, as a professional. And if I wanted to, con, you know, continue to, to, to excel and get value and, and be compensated also, you know, for, mm-hmm. for what I did, it was all mm-hmm. based on that knowledge and experience. And right. it was at that point in time that I kind of had that kind of, you know, epiphany moment, like, you, you know, you're, you're not getting out. <laughs> <laughs> you're embedded now. You're um, embedded yeah. Yeah. Now. You're not getting out like a, a lateral move is yeah. probably not, yeah. you know, not going to work to another sector. So, you know, double down on stay in the sector, but what yeah. can you do differently? How can you find that? And I was like really that. fortunate to, to be able to kind of make that transition, find that, you know, outside of production, especially in a city like Vancouver, where there are such an established industry, there are many, many roles okay. um, that are outside of production, you know, within, within all the different industry associations, yeah. within, within government, you know, we're seeing a lot of people, people in my kind of age where they're trying to get out of production, going into running facilities or or a leadership like like Clara moving into consulting and sustainability, yeah. uh, other peers that are going into running equipment rental houses. So yeah. they've you know, it's nice to be able to see now that there are pathways right, out of right. production. And but you know, going back to the earlier point is like you know, if you're younger, you know, there's this idea now that you know, just do whatever you you know you want in your 20s. It doesn't have any consequences. Yeah. I, I would disagree. Like I think that you know, your 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 20s and your and your and your, into your 30s, do whatever you want, whatever you like, but know that. Those skills and those experiences mm. will start to define your career in in, in your 40s yeah. and your 50s. Like you know, yeah. there's no you can't go back and recapture that. So what you if you're going to learn something, make sure you learn it well and expect that you know yeah. if you want to continue to move in that in that direction and, and, and advance that you're going to have to rely on those things that you do in your 20s. Mm, that's a really good point. That's a really yeah. good point. And I yeah. think one that's worth considering for a lot of people. You know, uh, yeah. I had a guest on just last week, uh, Latif Nasser of the WNYC Studios Radio Lab. I'm not sure you're familiar. It's, a, it's his podcast. Mm. It's a yeah. radio program. Yeah, broadcast around the world. And he was talking about this point to a degree. And uh, in terms of his path, at least initially, you know, he had some interests, some interests, you know, whether it be science, whether it be journalism, that he was wanted to center himself around. And that's what mm-hmm. he did. And then as his sort of career progressed, he was getting a little bit more cerebral about it in terms of, okay, well, where would I like to go with this? And it's mm. kind of reminding me what you're, you're speaking of right now too. Like early on, you had some you know, varied experiences, but as you progress through your career, you begin to, to understand the industry perhaps better. You begin to, to make connections. You had no newer ideas that were coming on board that you could be a little bit more cerebral about it and be like, okay, well, this is, I think, where I would like to go now. So you had this sort of like mm. broad based sort of experience, it sounds like in areas that you had some degree of interest in, and then things began to take shape. Am I into something here? Is that kind of how? Oh it yeah. Went yeah, for, yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and, you know, the other aspect of that was, is, you know, I don't know if everyone experiences this or not, but you know, when I was younger, I was, you know, I was restless, 
and and I think why I, I was I was moving around a lot. I got some some jobs out of out of my sales and marketing program, mostly in professional sales. And I was always the employee of the month in the first you know three to six months, and then yeah. and then. And then I was either leaving or being walked out the door within the year, right? <laughs> um, be, because, you know, my motivation quickly dropped off and I was very restless. And that's, I think, why the film industry provided me for a great 20 years, because it's very project-based. Exactly. Right? And, the new and, thing, the new thing, yeah, the new thing. Yeah. Top of it. yeah. And that, that served me very really well because there was always, you know, always change and variety of different people, different projects. And so a project-based work environment was great for my first 20 years. Interesting enough, you know, the last 20 years, now I'm, you know, I've that's much less attractive to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm attracted to like things that have, have longevity. Right. And as you right. said, you know, bigger and, and, and bigger scope and bigger impact. Yeah. So you, in your career, you don't like, you might go through a couple changes like that in your lifetime where you completely mm-hmm. change, you know, you, the way you want to work. I just been fortunate. I've been able to change the way I want to work, but still stay in the same, the same sector. Right. All right. Well, this talk of me is just more flying through it and mm-hmm. I could ask you a billion more questions, but uh, I'm conscious of your time. So we are heading into the very last segment here, Jeff, and it's a crystal ball segment. As the name implies, we're looking towards the future, usually trends, predictions, so on and so forth. And I'd like to return back to the city of Vancouver itself, you know, in terms of its place within the mm-hmm. film and television industry and moving forward. You know, what, what uh, developments are exciting for you looking forward? You know, what, what are some things that we should keep an eye on coming out of the city and within that industry? Well, I think, you know, we talked a lot about clean energy first. I think we will be, my hope is that we'll be the first city by hopefully by 2030 where film productions can be made without ever running a diesel generator. That's not too far away. Yeah. I think one of the areas that I think hopefully we'll start to see and, you know, everyone's dealing with this, but I want to be able to work with the industry to find a solution as quickly as possible is, is on training and development. You know, everyone in the, every industry in the world's, how do you attract talent? Right. And we have about 25% increase in studio space coming online, like being built right now in Vancouver. That's going to mean 25% more shows that need to go into 25% more, more crew. And, and so that's, you know, that's a big, big challenge. So I think we're going to see a lot more focus on, on, you know, workforce and labor development, but with Vancouver, you know, some of the unique aspects of Vancouver is, Kind of go back to our earlier discussion about what we're doing and why we're, the areas we're progressive in is, you know, through diversity and, and inclusion and through reconciliation with the First Nations. I think that there's some really, really interesting intersections of those opportunities mm-hmm. and, and including with sustainability. So, you know, you put, you, you know, sustainability, it's all about, you know, like all those, you know, the, the, the transformation of, of how you do business. Yeah. They all kind of in, intersect. And so as a city, I think we can support the industry a lot through through those efforts and, and again, continue to kind of be a leader. The And then the other aspect is, you know, kind of interesting, kind of the, kind of the more exciting uh, nerdy part of it in a way too, is <laughs> the, the, the technology that's the, yeah. the change that's going on. And, you know, there's a lot of buzz right now. The latest thing in, in the film industry is virtual production stages where they have these LED screens and they can put any environment you want in the background and actors okay. work inside of them. And they're, they're, you know, I've been in, in, in them and they're, they're massive and the stuff that you can do inside them is pretty incredible from creating in a whole other worlds and sci-fi right, to being able right. to maybe put somebody on a mountaintop that would be normally really hard to get to. I saw a commercial for a uh, company that does sporting gear and it was uh, all taking place with a conversation on a ski lift. Yeah. Right. So they just hung a ski lift in a stage and had this whole world around them. And so it's an exciting technology. It's very, it's advanced from the idea of the green screen to the blue screen because you actually are in the environment. The actors can play off of it. Wow. It, refle- it reflects in their, yeah, it reflects in the windows of a car or the, your glasses. You can see it. So it's very real. What's really interesting about that to me is the current model for production is you have physical production. Yeah. And then you have post production. Mm-hmm. And those can be, they're kind of mostly, for the most part, siloed. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you do your raw physical production, then you send it off and post starts happening. Yeah. Uh, or it can be simultaneous, but they're there. They can be different parts of the world. You know, watch any film right yeah. now and you see the visual effects production companies that one right. film and they're all over the world. Right. Right, um, right. With virtual production, you move the, the post-production to pre-production. You have to create those worlds before you shoot them. Okay. And then when you're shooting them, you have this entire tech team in the behind camera that are running all the images and the angles gotcha. and the that. So you actually are bringing together the groups now that can't be siloed. They have to be in the same space at the same time. And so for cities where you have both a really strong production environment and a strong visual effects team or, or, or infrastructures, which we have in Vancouver, that transition will be a lot easier. Yeah, and, and it's a true opportunity, right? Yeah, a, a city that has one but not the other is going to struggle, I think, with mm-hmm. this as, as it advances. 
Um, so I'd say that would be an area where to, to really kind of keep an eye on. And in a funny way, it's almost like a crystal ball, but it's, it's going back to filmmaking, yeah. you know, and in, in, yeah. in the early days when people had to paint, you know, the backdrops, you know, in the old yeah. Western yeah. stuff I do, and they had yeah. the painted backdrop, essentially it's, it's, it's the modern version of the, of the painted yeah. backdrop, but all the time is now being spent on creating it before you film instead of after. So I'm excited about where that goes. Yeah. 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 It's transformational. I used that word earlier, yeah, but I mean, yeah. that, that, that really has the power to really shift that industry in a whole different sort of realm or sphere altogether. So, you know, yeah. being at the top of that and sort of witnessing this unfold and obviously trying to best position the city to take advantage of all of this, yeah, it must be an exciting opportunity to, to be involved with. So yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, I must say, Jeff, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I myself of you know i feel a bit selfish in saying this but like i feel like i've been learning tons and tons and tons and i know and i know listeners are going to be you know walking away from this talk you know armed with a whole bunch of additional insights and information concerning that industry as a whole and where maybe you know they might be able to fit in or make an entry point into it all so mm -hmm. i can't thank you enough for uh, for your time and uh, all of your insights right thank you well, for those interested in learning more about Jeff and his work, of course, you can go check him out on LinkedIn. You can even reach out to him there, perhaps. And also, too, if you like today's show, I mean, please be sure to share. I think it goes a long ways, you know, in terms of discussion points that we brought up. And it could be helpful to, to not only yourself, but to others. And also, you can rate, review and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. And head on over to YouTube. Within the last year, I did launch a channel over there where you can catch full video conversations, much like the conversation today that we had with Jeff. And the cool thing there is we'll have some imagery associated with the talk so you can kind of take it on in a different sort of way. And then finally, too, don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Life As A, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living. Thank you.